welcome to this complimentary webinar titled is 5g new radio flexible enough to deliver diverse services powered by word solutions my name is prasad govindarajan uh, the host of this webinar in this session we're going to give you an overview of the characteristics of the 5g new radio air interface that allows it to support a much wider range of applications and services than 4G LTE. Award Solutions is a proven leader in training with over 20 years of experience, and we've served over 250 customers, ranging from chipset, device, and network equipment vendors to network operators throughout the world. We've trained over 100,000 students on LTE and over 11,000 students we're excited to impart some of our knowledge on 5G to you today. And by the way, we've reserved time at the end of the session for a Q&A. So if you have any questions during the session, please use the chat feature uh, to ask those questions. The chat icon is the icon that looks like a thought bubble. And if you click on that, it'll allow you to enter the, the, uh, the questions. So please address the questions and all, all comments and questions that you have all panelists. By the way, we're also recording this session and we'll send you an email with a link to the recording and also to the PDF of the presentation within the next couple of days. Today is Charlie Martin. He has over 36 years of experience in the telecommunications industry and is a subject matter expert in radio access networks with experience in design, optimization and troubleshooting in both the operator as well as the vendors. God, I appreciate it. First of all, I'd like to thank you, buddy, for taking time out of your busy day webinar to get a deeper understanding of 5G. Reward your interest in 5G. We do have a couple of special offers to thank you and to encourage you to explore 5G in more depth. Um, I'm going to show a couple of offers here and Prasad will the links codes for these offers offering a 5G NR air interface course. Attention starting October 14th. Use the code webinar during the checkout and this offer is valid through September 30th. There's significant savings there. So that's the first offer. The second one is there's a, uh, a course called 5G networks and services. That session starts October 22nd. Again, using this code webinar and also this valid through so we'll, uh, Prasad will chat that information to you so you can easily copy it. And you, if you have more interest in 5G, uh, those will be available to you. All right, so uh, today we're gonna talk about 5G and we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna compare 5G to 4G in terms of flexibility and ability to support a diverse array of services. So what we're going to for in the next hour is we're going to describe the 5G service usage scenarios and they're quite diverse today. We've come a long way since the days of uh, 2G and 3. go through the performance requirements for 5G services and they're they're pretty pretty stringent requirements. Outline the 5G air interface enhancements are available to meet the performance requirements for 5G services. And then the last objective here, we're going to summarize the 5G radio frame structure enhancements. And we're going to reference this that back to LTE, which is our, our current uh, leading wireless technology. The way we've broken up the um, sections, we're going to go through those service performance requirements first. Then we'll get into the air interface. Then we'll get into the frame structure. And at the end, we're going to save some time, 10 or 15 minutes for question and answer. We're going to start off right here in our very first piece of service performance requirements. All right. Uh, we're going to lead off here with what I call the ITU applications and services triangle. Let's just stop for a second. Think back to seven or eight years ago when, or nine years ago even, when we were to standardize 4G. 
right? Before that, before 4G and LT, we had things like UMTS and CDMA. Um, what was the main service requirement for LTE? LTE was, it was high-speed internet. It wasn't, we didn't have a lot of different applications and services that we were targeting. It was just, everybody's doing wireless internet. It's getting more and more important. We're seeing more and more people do things like video wireless. And so what's really important is high-speed internet over wireless. Cellular. That was the main driver of services in 4G. Now we've come a long way. Right, we have uh, all those years of, of uh, experience now working with all kinds of customers. We know what consumers need. We know what enterprises need. So let's go and talk about some of these services that we're envisioning here. At the very top, we have something called enhanced mobile broadband. This is the first uh, point on the triangle. And what we care about mostly here is the high area traffic capacity and peak data rates. I think of this as what most consumers want. Better and better uh, service quality, what, 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 what matters to us? We want better coverage, want higher speed. We're 70%, uh, between 60 and 70% of the world today is watching, our, is watching video over their cellular devices, over the user equipment, right? So it turns out that Things like over the top video are very dominant. Uh, YouTube, for example, watching YouTube videos or uh, Netflix here in the US or Hulu or um, Amazon, uh, things like that. Over the top video. We want more and more of that. Some things that are coming down the pike here that are really important is, is what? Ultra high definition or 4K TV. Nowadays, a lot of people are doing streaming video. Doing things, what I call the, the term is cutting the cord, where you decided to getting your normal t television services through the, um, the, the typical providers like cable, for example, or satellite TV, things like that, going to streaming video. And one of the big changes that's been happening, we're already past the point. I would say this, that when my family started doing streaming video a, a couple of years ago, found is that with your typical high definition uh, TV for today and on the order of say five megabits per second, is enough to give you good quality for, look, for looking at high definition video, high definition video. However, now that we're going to ultra high definition 4K TV, that a couple of years ago, we weren't ready. The devices that we had out there, what I call the multimedia aggregation devices, such as a Roku or a Google Chromecast or Apple TV or things like that, uh, they weren't quite ready. Um, and also our speeds weren't quite ready, even though the content was becoming ready. Well, fast forward to today, what we see is the contents there, the devices are ready. And now we're seeing that our, our air interface is, is being able to provide the, the necessary speed. So what's happening is that as we go towards 4K TV, depending upon how our, our, our video codecs are, we're probably gonna need on the order of 20, 25 megabits per second. We're gonna move up a serious order of magnitude and going from quote normal high definition TV to 4K ultra high definition TV, All right? So there's a, there's a big change that's coming. And we know that what else is down the road? 8K TV, we've heard about that. If you go into any of the stores nowadays and you look at what kind of televisions are available, actually you'll see the older high definition um, uh, TVs. There's not a whole lot of those anymore. Everything nowadays that's, that's being sold is 4K capable. So, so we're seeing the, absolutely the drivers for needing more and more, speed, right? more and more speed. Moving forward to another point in the triangle, ultra reliable and low latency communications. Um, we have here at the point self-driving cars. So this is not your, the this type of application is quite different than just you know watching streaming video, our typical services, best effort services that we, we talk about up here, right? Down here, we've got some very targeted applications that are sensitive, 
right? Also, they have to be very reliable. And self-driving cars or autonomous cars is a very obvious example. We see a lot of movement on this today all over the world. The desire for, for not only for consumers and businesses, but also governments would like to see this happen, autonomous cars. I was not a believer in this two years ago. Believer now. Seen is that the car manufacturers have been driving very hard on this. They have developed very good capabilities today to drive on, say, the I call it the highway level. When you're you're driving, you don't have a lot of turns and stops and starts and stops and things like that. But if you're doing highway driving, we already see that all the major car manufacturers have some level of autonomous car capability, and they've incorporated vision mapping sensors. LIDAR, things like that. And I've actually seen reviews on, on several cars where they've, the uh, people writing the reviews have had that car drive them for long distances, 20, 30 kilometers or miles, whatever, they, whatever you're using. And they've taken their hands off the steering wheel and they don't touch the gas pedal or the brake and the car will take them to their destination. So, where, where we see the, the intersection now, so if you look at what's happening today, the manufacturers are doing everything they can with what they have, right? But what we'd like to see and, and where they are moving towards is a world where we're going to have, quote, land-based base stations communicating with cars to give them communications ability and control, all right? So we're going to add that to the existing capabilities, and there's something called V to X everything messaging. Automobile industry has standardized a set of messages. It's not 3GPP, it's the automotive industry. The Society of Automotive Engineers has come up with a messaging set called V to X messaging. What we need our self-driving cars to be able to do is to talk to each other, send these messages to each other, and communicate with the other cars around them when they want to make changes in how they're driving. So there's a couple of ways of doing it. The um, Wi-Fi industry is going after this. Also, the cellular industry is going after this. And what you'll see is that in 3GPP specifications, there is a lot of work being done to set up the, the new 5QIs and also the older QCIs to support self-driving cars, support vehicle everything messaging. So that's a very important one. Public safety is another one. Um, Many, in many countries across the world, we want to give more and more capabilities to our public safety organizations, people who respond to emergencies, right? Like police, fire, emergency medical, like next generation mission critical services, push to talk, video are becoming important. And guess what mission critical means for a public safety user? It usually means two things. It works faster and it's more reliable, all right? thus ultra-reliable and low latency. You'll also see public safety is a big upcoming uh, set of applications. The triangle, reliable low latency communications. And on the third part of the, of the triangle is massive machine type communications known as IoT. With the Internet of Things, we know that everything is Becoming wirelessly connected, not only on the consumer side, but also on the business side. We see um, the home, something that's coming, it's already here, it's been here. One of the questions I like to ask many students is how many connected devices, wireless connected devices, do you have in your home to connect to the internet one way or another, whether it's cellular directly? or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whatever. And I have many students now who are telling me they have more than 30 or 40 devices in their homes, kinds of things. Smart home. GPP called, 3GPP calls it machine type communications. That's their terminology for IoT, right? Communications. Of course, we put the word M on front of it, massive, because we see this growing and growing and growing. And it hasn't been growing for the last year. It's been growing for the last we see now also, in addition to consumers, enterprises, cities. About where you live, typically, you live in a city, and if you pay city taxes, what do you get in return for your taxes? You get city services. 
So they may be supplying utilities such as water removal, the electricity, right? They're also providing uh, transportation services, say for schools, right? So they may have a fleet of automobiles. So there's all kinds of services that they may be providing. And, and, and just like consumers, they're always looking for ways to be able to more efficiently off, offer those services and more cost effectively and, and um, reliably. And can we do that with wireless? So those are the three big points in the triangle where you know, most of our, of our applications are falling somewhere in the triangle. Okay, and, and each of those different types of services has a, a different need for performance in the wireless technology. Okay, so we look at the, how we're going into 5G, a lot more detailed information about the applications than we did going into 4G LTE. Back then, it's high speed internet. Some of the targets uh, that we have for 5G. The uh, definitely very, very lofty targets. So peak data rate to a single user, single user looking to provide up 20 gigabits per second, which is an amazing speed, and 10 gigabits per second on the uplink. If I compare that to the targets for LTE and LTE Advanced, the latest targets are something called LTE Advanced Pro. Advanced Pro, and the target there for LTE Advanced Pro is three gigabits per second. By comparison, it's about seven times. Connection density: we're looking to be able to serve a million devices per kilometer squared, which is amazing. A kilometer squared is a thousand kilometers times a thousand kilometers. That's a million kilometers squared. So, seeing basically one device. meter which is amazing imagine a one square kilometer and in every tile of one meter by one meter there's a device okay so the connection density is is huge in terms of latency in the ran we're looking for less than one millisecond what do i mean here i tend to focus on on what i consider to be the 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 um, process that really needs to where we need to improve the latency and where that is is that's the hybrid ARQ feedback loop on the uplink. Uplink Hark today there is a round trip limitation of eight milliseconds. On the uplink, get the uh, Akronak and the downlink, and then send data again. Either send new data or send a retransmission. That's eight milliseconds. Down to less than a millisecond. In terms of cell throughput, we would like devices to be able to load at 10 megabits per second per meter squared. So imagine, I tie this to the connection density. Imagine that we have one device every meter by meter square in a, a, a square kilometer, and we imagine that each of them can download at 10 megabits per second. Using density plus density. Cell edge data rate, which means the worst part of the of the network, right? At the edge of our cells, what kind of throughput could, would we like to, su to support to a single user? We'd like it to be no less, less than 100 megabits per second on the downlink and 50 megabits per second on the uplink. So that's amazing as well. Imagine that you're at the worst parts of the network, at the edge of the cell, far away from the cell. Still able to get connectivity, but you're far away, and you're still able to get these kind of. That's what we're shooting for in our uh, main performance targets for 5G, set by the ITU, International Telecommunications Union, and 3GPP, of course, who's standardizing standardized UMTS, LTE, and now also 5G. Work with the ITU. Support those. So that's it for our service performance requirements. It's always important to understand, right, before we, we move on to the next section, 
always need to understand the application requirements first. What are the applications? What are the scenarios? What are the performance requirements in terms of put and latency? Those are the two main, remember, what are the, the main um, uh, things you need to look at when you talk about air interface performance? It's really two main things. We always think throughput. The other thing is latency. Let's go ahead and let's talk about the air interface. Let's look at the features here. So, envisioning moving forward with 5G services, one of the big questions is always, what is the spectrum that we're going to use? So, what we've done is that uh, we've broken it down into portions of spectrum moving forward. There's sub six gigahertz. All right, sub six gigahertz means, you know, all the stuff that we're doing on LTE nowadays, whatever the, those those uh, carrier frequencies are, of course, those are also in consideration for 5G. So if we're doing things at two gigahertz, 600, 700 megahertz, 800 megahertz, um, 3.5, whatever, those are all sub six gigahertz. All right, so that is one major area that GPP addresses in terms of standardizing um, how that spectrum is used in the interoperation between networks, the radio access network and the devices, gigahertz, right? The other part is up here above 24 gigahertz and typically called millimeter wave. Interesting, so two big portions of spectrum, sub six gigahertz, then millimeter wave spectrum above 24 above 24 gigahertz which is amazing it's it's it, at first glance it's kind of like well that doesn't make sense we've always liked the lower frequency stuff the lower the frequency we get the better coverage we get it turns out that if you if you just look at where we've gone for the last 25 years in cellular we can use millimeter wave now because we've gotten as mature as we have what happens has happened last eight years is that we have been densifying our networks more and more and more and in many countries across the world seeing that we have major deployments small cell technology in particular CRAN with small cell technology where we know that we have a baseband unit we have we know that we have remote radio heads we can separate them and in, in many, many parts of the world now, what we can do in our, in our densest areas, we can take those baseband units and put them into what's called a hub site. Fiber out to the, the actual cell sites, which have small cells, and we can actually, where are the hottest areas of the network? Typically, it's been downtown, right? That's where the biggest concentration of people is. And so many parts of the world, in many cities, we see that we have small cells at much lower heights, you know, less than, uh, say, uh, 10 meters, 30 feet, and much closer together. So we've densified. Because we've densified like that, well, the cell radiuses are very, are very small. It, it makes sense now that we have that infrastructure built out that we can put a millimeter wave off of that. So the frequency is so high and the, the, the cell radius is so small, it can fit over the top of the existing CRAN LTE small cell. Provide coverage within that dense urban grid. All right, so millimeter wave is actually important. Much larger channel bandwidths, up to 400 megahertz. Compare this to LTE, we have up to 20 megahertz, the maximum uh, carrier bandwidth in LTE, so much larger. Do uh, beam forming in MIMO now, cost effectively, and also technically, um, because we're moving up into much, much higher frequencies at millimeter wave, we can now put many more antenna elements and the spacing between the antenna elements is much smaller now because we're up in that high frequency. Remember, it, as we get higher and higher in frequency, the, the uh, wavelengths get smaller and smaller and smaller. So as the wavelengths get smaller, the antenna elements get smaller, and so does the spacing between the elements. And so now, seeing that we've absolutely seen that vendors can build 
base stations, the, the genode B, if you will, a millimeter wave genode B that has a very small size, can pack a lot of antenna elements in a small size, be integrated into the, the radio portion of the genode B and, and be able to do beam forming and higher order MIMO. So this is an amazing thing. It's never, I never saw this happening to a large LTE or UMTS because we were always at the lower frequencies that had very large wavelengths, which means that if we were trying to do beam forming in MIMO, the antenna, um, uh, size of the antennas would have to be really big. And it made it difficult to do. So now with the advent of millimeter wave, we're seeing beam forming and shorter MIMO capabilities come around. We have a flexible frame structure numerology that we'll go through. Hold on to that. And we have new channel coding techniques that are going to be more efficient than the older turbo coding. LDPC is going to replace turbo coding. Polar coding is going to replace convolutional coding. That was used for physical layer signaling to provide more reliability. Those are also changes that are coming. Now let's look at the frame structure. Well, I've already hinted that we have a lot more flexibility. We're going to see that here now. So one, one thing to discuss here, so we're going to go through several, several uh, topics for discussion here, is that if you look at the basic time unit in LTE, so we, we know that uh, our, our data, all this stuff is have digital technology, computers, there's going to be some kind of a clock rate. Think of it as a clock rate, and what is the basic unit of time? The basic unit of time in LTE is 32.55 nanoseconds. What we're going to support is a much faster rate in 5G, 0 0.5 nanoseconds. Much, much, sm a much smaller time interval, much, much faster sampling rates. Okay, and that's going to help us a lot because we're going to be able to now break down processes in a, into much smaller chunks of time. The co component carrier bandwidths, I've already talked about this, up to 20 megahertz in LTE, up to 400 megahertz, 5G. And, and if you're wondering if it's possible to use that kind of bandwidth, it's already happening today. We see carriers who have millimeter wave spectrum who are deploying carriers, you can go out with a spectrum, and make some measurements and you'll see carriers that are, I've already seen carriers up to 100 megahertz wide being deployed in 5G, which is amazing to me, 100 megahertz wide carrier and multiples of them in some cases. It's not just a pipe dream, it's really happening. We will have flexible subcarrier spacing in 5G, unlike 4G where we have, we know that we have our sub our subcarriers, our spectrum is divided up into many subcarriers, right? Each can be modulated and carry data LTE, it's fixed at 15 kilohertz. In 5G, we have different possibilities. 15 kilohertz, actually all the way through 480 kilohertz. Possible by standards to support 480 kilohertz wide sub, uh, subcarrier spacing. Why do we need the wider subcarrier spacings? It's because of Doppler, Doppler shift and Doppler effect. What happens is that with, with mobility, we know that we, we've been dealing with this for a long time. Right? We've always had technology capabilities to deal with Doppler effect and Doppler shift. It causes a frequency shift. If you have a mobility, and you remember the old story about the train, if the train, go ahead and pull on the, the, uh, the whistle, the train whistle, and the train's coming at you, it's like, oh, as soon as it passes you, you get that tone, right? It makes you shift in the frequency. That can cause issues. What happens is that we have these different carrier spacings as Doppler gets worse, Use a bigger subcarrier spacing. It helps us deal with the Doppler effect. E, we only have one scheduling interval, also known as a transmit time interval, a TTI. It's fixed at one millisecond. It means if I'm sitting here underneath a the uh, a base station, you know, it'd be an LTE. I can be scheduled my data on a millisecond by millisecond basis. Right? Sooner than that, every millisecond I can line up for data and I can get data scheduled every millisecond. Here, I flexible. 
and it can be smaller than one millisecond. So you, while we support with a one millisecond TTI, we support much smaller TTIs now. So a half a millisecond, quarter of a millisecond, an eighth of a millisecond, for example. And that's important. Imagine your low latency, remember the ultra reliable and low latency um, uh, applications? We'd like to be able to schedule data more often. More often, that reduces latency. An example there. So big, big change in flexibility there. In terms of the transmission schemes, in LP we had OFDM and OFDMA on the downlink, single carrier FDMA in the uplink. We know that we did single carrier FDMA uplink to help with life. Remember the old EAPR, average power ratio. This average power ratio is, is improved in SC FDMA versus OFDMA. Better PAPR means you get better battery life. Over in 5G, we support OFDM, OFDMA in both the downlink or the uplink, okay? Why would we want to go to OFDMA, OFDMA or OFDM in the uplink versus single carrier FDMA? The SC FDMA gets the advantage in battery life, but the OFDM or OFDMA gets the advantage in. So the default that we're going to be doing today that we've already seen being launched is OFDM in the uplink. I just want to point something out here. I don't want you to think that the cyclic prefix OFDM is intrinsically any different than what we have in, in also cyclic prefix. Right, so LTE, we have cyclic prefix before our subcarriers in, in the domain, we do the exact same thing in 5G. Now, instead of using the SCFDMA, the big takeaway here is we're doing OFDMA both directions. This is an option, but we don't see it being used yet. But more about the frame structure. LTE, we have two types of frame structures. We have a type one for F transmission and reception schemes, and we have two for TDD, right? Here in 5G, we have one frame structure for both FDD and CDD. And by the way, um, parts of the world, operators are mostly used to using FDD, right? So that means we have a separate carrier for the downlink, versus the uplink. So actually we have two carriers, one for downlink, one for uplink. We do duplexing, all right? TDD is getting more and more important today in the world because a lot of the spectrum is TDD. Here in the United States, all the millimeter wave spectrum that's currently available is all TDD. But the new free carriers uh, are new frequencies that are being supported, for example, sub six gigahertz, three and a half uh, gigahertz is also TDD, all right? So TDDs, become, with the advent of 5G, there's going to be a lot more TDD systems out there. And we have one frame structure for FDD and TDD and 5G. In terms of TDD, a big advantage over, over 4G, with 4G TDD that we have today, at the, the, it's the, the, um, or the amount of, Time slots that are available for downlink versus uplink is does not change over time, right? So if you have a, a TDD system, the 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 number of time slots for downlink versus uplink has to be statically set. It stays that way. True here, it can be dynamic and it can react to traffic. That's another big change here. Flexibility for TDD in five. of the number of configurations for TD, there's a lot more for 5G. There's up to 56 different uplink versus downlink configurations for TDD. 4G, we had only seven. A lot more flexibility there. Of the radio resources that are available, OFDM, we have subcarriers, little subcarriers, right? Here in, in, in 4G LTE, we have 15 kilohertz wide subcarriers and a 20 megahertz wide carrier can fit 1200 subcarriers, and a, which is 100 resource blocks. There's 12 subcarriers per resource block in the frequency domain, right? In the same 
Well, actually, it's 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 we have a lot more uh, uh, spectrum that we can use. From remember, I said up to 400 megahertz wide carriers. We can have if this was a, if we were using the 15 kilohertz numerology, we could support 3,300 subcarriers, 275 resources. Right, so a lot more subcarriers and resource blocks, physical resource resource blocks available in 5G. In LTE, our bandwidth is 100% accessible by UEs and is schedulable by the ENODE. All right, the things that we're doing over here in 5G, allowing for the operator to subdivide the carrier bandwidth different types of technologies which means they can support different types of applications it's called a bandwidth part UP stands for bandwidth part and what we can do is we could say let's, let's say for example I had, I had a 100 megahertz wide carrier I could subdivide, imagine that we subdivided half of it for consumer use who are doing, again, 70% of the traffic is over the top video. So we, we set it up with a numerology that, that fits that EMBB uh, uh, um, scenario really well. Imagine the other half of the spectrum, we, we set it up to support ultra reliable low latency communications. We can do that with bandwidth parts. So that again is a, of a big difference, 5G versus 4G. Now let's go ahead and break down the frame structure. I'm showing the LTE frame structure again, all right? One subcarrier times one symbol is a resource element. Remember the sub subcarrier, if we have a 15 kilohertz subcarrier, I can modulate that. If I modulate that, it's carrying data bits. It's carrying data bits, we call it a symbol. Symbolize, a symbol means it symbolizes a certain arrangement of data bits. Twelve subcarriers right, times one slot equals a resource block. Twelve subcarriers, and this is vertically. This is in the um, frequency domain. All right. We also have the time domain, which is where we talk about symbols. So twelve subcarriers vertically, and seven symbols is going to be a slot. Then we have. I'm sorry. Let me let me break this down some more. I'm actually going to go bottom to top. We have a 10 millisecond frame. Okay. We have 10 subframes, one millisecond each. And for each subframe, we have two slots: slot zero, slot one. And that's the way it is, period, for LTE. Okay. This is one slot here. This is the other slot here. The slot has 12 subcarriers in the frequency domain, seven symbols, zero through six in the domain. That's LTE. The frame structure in 5G, again, start at the bottom. We have a 10 millisecond frame, just like before. Now we have our slots, but here's where we have a major difference. We can fit, before we said we had two slots in a subframe, two slots in a subframe all, always. Here it's variable, depending upon your numerology. So here, for a subcarrier spacing of 15 kilohertz, one slot is one millisecond. If we go to this numerology here with the 30 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, guess what? We can fit two slots in that same one millisecond. Time. And now our TTI, remember I said about LTE, the transmit time interval is one millisecond. Our transmit time interval is half, it's half of that. 0.5 milliseconds, so I can fit two slots right into that one millisecond amount of time. Here with a subcarrier spacing of 60 kilohertz, I can fit four slots in that one millisecond uh, portion of time. Now our TTI is what, a quarter of a millisecond. So bottom line, TTI now, in LTE TTI was always one millisecond, two slots in the time domain period. Here it's equal to uh, the slot size. Equal to the slot size always, have a variable slot size in terms of time. So again, it's OFDMA. It looks a lot like um, LTE, 
You still have one saber sub carrier times one symbol equals one resource element. You still have sub carriers, right? In the frequency domain equals one resource block, all right? But the here, so that those things don't change. What changes here is really the thing to focus on is it's transmit time interval now is equal to the slot. And it we can configure size of the slots, a variable slot size. Okay, so we can fit more slots, smaller time each. Exactly what I show over here to the right. Slot is typically 14 symbols. That stays the same across the different slots. Numerology. I'm going to hear this term numerology a lot. When I think of numerology, I think it's numbers in some way, shape, or form. What it means here is that we're going to have, as you've already probably gotten from this talk, is that we're going to have configurable, different configurable uh, the parameters, if you will. And depending, and really the key is the subcarrier spacing. To allow different subcarrier spacings, Depending on the subcarrier spacing you choose, some of the other parameters will change. And what we do is we have a system, if you will, of these different configuration sets, assign a number to them. That's our numerology. That's what's over here to the left, our numerology mu. We're going to assign these numbers as a numerology 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick a subcarrier spacing, all right, depending upon the that we're deploying at the, the size and the frequency at which is at. The higher the frequency, the bigger the issue with that Doppler effect that I talked about. The higher the frequency, right, the larger the subcarrier spacing you have to choose. Okay, so depending on that subcarrier spacing, you will then determine the sum, symbol duration 66.67 microseconds, LTE. 15 kilohertz, same as LTE. Maximum resource blocks, 270, a lot more than LTE. Maximum channel bandwidth, a carrier is 50 megahertz, this numerology. Slot duration is one millisecond. Number of slots per frame is 10. Number of slots per subframe is one. Number of symbols is 14. So if I say 14 symbols, that's 14 subcarriers, right? Each of them modulated. See now, if we go to this next one here, 30 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, our symbol duration gets halved. Block stays roughly the same. Channel bandwidth supportable is much greater, now 100 megahertz. What do you see happen with the slot duration? These are the two things to watch for. The slot duration is now only half a millisecond. Schedule down to the half a second in terms of time interval. I have 20 slots per frame. I have 20 slots per frame. And as you choose your subcarrier spacings, I want to call your attention here. You see where the slot duration gets smaller and smaller and smaller is the transmit time interval. And smaller and smaller transmit time intervals. I extend more and more slots per frame. This is called scalable bandwidth, scalable capacity. The number of symbols stays the same. What happens is an operator, you work with your vendor, and you determine you know, what is the spectrum that you have available, what are you going to deploy, what are the carrier bandwidths that you can support, at what frequency, and then you will go ahead and choose a numerology. Remember, it's possible to have more than one numerology. You can break down your, your carrier into bandwidth parts. I hear the term resource grids a lot in 5G. I, I started using that term a long time ago with LTE. Resource grid basically refers to your carrier bandwidth, subframe size, you have different subcarrier spacings. Remember, those are your numerologies. One, mu equals zero. Carrier spacing is 15 kilohertz. Subcarrier spacing is 30 kilohertz. Example, and so that's another term you're going to hear when we talk about numerology. Is my resource grid look like right, for my my 5G radio access network?
the concept of resource blocks. And, um, we know that resource blocks in the time domain, one, or excuse me, frequency domain, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 10, 11, 12. For LTE and 4G, it's always 12 subcarriers right, per resource block in the frequency domain. The frequency domain. Same thing here. If you count these up, it's 12. Zero through 11 if you like to start at zero. Go ahead and, and, and go through a summary here, and then we'll go ahead and get into uh, A. Okay. Um, at 4G versus 5G. Um, we talked about the basic time unit here in LT is 32, roughly two and a half nanoseconds. For our time unit, right? A nanosecond, which sets us up to give us more, much more flexibility in the time domain immediately, right? In terms of the carrier bandwidth, we can support up to 20 megahertz wide bandwidth in LTE. And go up to 400 megahertz wide bandwidth in 5G. Uh, in terms of subcarrier spacing for data in LT, it's always 15 kilohertz. For 5G, it's between 15 kilohertz, actually all the way up to 480 kilohertz. But these are the, the typical ones. In terms of the time domain, how often can we schedule data? Every millisecond, 5G is flexible, and it's while we do offer the same option at one millisecond, we can schedule much more often now, half a millisecond, a quarter, one eighth of a millisecond. We can actually schedule even faster. Than that. It's based on 3GPP standards, it's possible to schedule down to this to the symbol, down to the symbol. Transmission schemes on downlink versus uplink, the basic uh, technology. We know that in LTE, we do OFDM and OFDMA on the downlink. We do single care FDMA on the uplink, right? So I always kind of wondered, well, will we always, will we do OFDM and OFDMA on the uplink? Well, in the future at some time, the answer is yes. 5G, and again, don't be thrown. When it says cyclic fix OFDM here, we also do cyclic prefix based OFDM and LTE. Bottom line, what this, this emphasizes is that we're using OFDM, OFDM and the downlink, OFDM, OFDM and the uplink as well. Don't see the subcarrier FDMA yet, but it is an option. It is possible to support in 5G. In terms of the frame structures, uh, we support two types in LTE, type one and type two, for FDD versus TDD. And then over in 5G, we have the same frame structure for both FDD and TDD. So the allocations, if you're doing TDD, what's, what's that? what I said with FDD, you have two carriers. One is, is uh, allocated for the downlink, one for the uplink, so they're independent of each other. With TDD, it's one carrier, one carrier, right, that does uplink and downlink, and it's broken up into time slots. I may not have explained it. But what happens is that if it's broken up into time slots, you have to decide how many are allocated to downlink, how many are allocated. To... For example, if you're watching video, most of your users are watching video, you want to have more for the downlink. Right? But if more of your people are, are, are doing Volpe, probably more like 50-50. Right? People are, are ideally, you know, have speakers, one person gets 50% of the time and the other is 50% of the time, right? So, so, so that's fixed in LTE over in 5G can be dynamic. Right? Any more configurations for TDD in 5G than we do for 4G? We have a lot more usable bandwidth and because we have a lot more usable bandwidth we can support a lot more subcarriers and resource blocks can with LTE. And the, another big takeaway here is that we don't have the ability to subdivide here in LTE and then out parts of it for one type of application portions that are service a different type of application. We can do that here 
via bandwidth parts, BWPs, okay, in 5G. That we're at our question and answer time. Um, go ahead and look at some of the uh, the questions that were chatted. Um, oh, very good. Here's a, here's a good question. What factors influence selecting a selecting a given subcarrier spacing? Are there any pros and cons of always using a higher subcarrier spacing versus a smaller subcarrier spacing? Good question. I think I I partly alluded to that. The main driver with breaking up the subcarriers or creating the different numerologies with the different subcarrier spacing was that the 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 spectrum that we were going to use for five is much wider in extent now what we were using for 4G LTE. For the most part in the world that we saw with LTE is that most operators using, say, three gigahertz and below. So I'll set the two and a half gigahertz, two gigahertz, sub one gigahertz. Now what's happened is that we've gone to this millimeter wave spectrum in many parts of the world have a lot of spectrum available and they have a huge amount of bandwidth. The issue there at the higher frequencies is that we get a worse issue with Doppler shift in order to, to uh, deal with that frequency smearing, if you will, that Doppler can cause in mobility to use bigger subcarrier spacing. So that's the number one thing that influences it, okay? Uh, in terms of pros and cons and using the higher subcarrier spacing, I don't think of it as, as um, we go back to the numerology. Go back to the numerology. Bear with me. The big takeaway, which is a surprise, is that for me anyway, what you see is the actual number of maximum resource blocks doesn't change that much upon the numerology you choose. Right? The takeaway here is that what really changes is the number of slots that you can send in a, in a frame. Right, so remember with the frame, frame is 10 milliseconds. Send a lot more slots, right? 160 slots here with numerology four versus 10 slots um, in numerology zero, which means I'm sending 16 times, excuse me, 1.6 times, oh, 16, 16 times as many slots uh, in 10 milliseconds as I am here. And I'm sending the same number of symbols in each slot. I actually am, because of the, the nature of um, our digital signal processing, our subcarrier spacings, how we do frequency to time conversion and all that with, with our technology is that we actually send many more symbols in the higher numerologies. I don't see, I don't, in terms of just pure capacity and data rates, I don't see a big difference. However, here's the biggie. What is the latency requirements of your applications? That's the other big. So if you're doing applications that require lower latency, you would like to select numerologies that support smaller slot durations. Right, because you can schedule more often. If you schedule more often, your hybrid ARQ cycle time can be much faster. Right, and so that's the other big consideration. There is latency. Very good question. Thank you. Um, other question: What are your thoughts on on voice as a five G service? Uh, my belief today is that for existing four G operators, being a voice. On 4G, if you're, we know that we were using UMTS for voice in the past, and we we had combined MTS and LTE networks. We would do things like circuit switch back. We, we even though we had LTE deployed for data for voice, we would have the users fall back to UMTS. To me, we'll do something similar to that in today's networks. We'll have 5G on top of 4G. To on 4G, if you're using Volti. Volti is very deployed in many, many um, uh, countries in the world today. So you can basically fall back to 4G for voice and continue to use 5G for data. But to me, over time, what will happen 
we will definitely over time, it will take its time, but we'll eventually start to move our carriers that support 4G, we'll refarm them to 5G over time, even if it's not millimeter wave. We know that millimeter wave gives us these great advantages in capacity and speed because of the high uh, uh, frequency and the um, a very small uh, wavelengths that we can pack 10 elements in the small side. We can do beam forming and, and order MIMO. Millimeter wave, we get those benefits. But even if it's not millimeter wave, even if we go back to refarm our spectrum from, say, 600 megahertz, 700 megahertz, 800 megahertz, megahertz, whatever, over time we'll want to refarm that to 5G as well, right? Because we still get those benefits with 5G, those flexibility benefits, better ability to support different types of applications in LTE. Over time, my, my belief is that we will one day, just like 4G is, is supplanting 3G, we will supplant 4G and, we'll, and then we'll be doing voice with 5G. And, and the, really the thing is, is that it's the best coverage at lower frequencies, right? So what do we like to do? We like to support voice on the lower frequencies. Okay, it's all 4G for that. Uh, but although I shouldn't say that, I've seen operators in the world who have, um, we, who have spectrum at the lower frequencies, such as six, seven hundred, eight hundred megahertz. Those operators might want to consider to do voice five G, even on five G. Um, about 240 kilo, kilohertz is 240 kilohertz used for data uh in release 15 support is only for explanation um, if you're planning to support 240 kilohertz for data i can say i can tell you this um what we see today and it really i'll answer your question by by referring to the numerologies seeing we have been seeing operators that we have the, the numerology zero through four, we have seen operators using numerologies three and four. We have seen this. I hope that answers your question. Numerology four is 240 kilohertz, it appears. Other question, I'm not able to answer it at this time. The question about TH present only on the first slot of each subframe. I'd have to go back and remember off the top of my head. Uh, so with that, uh, those are the questions that I see on our, our chat. Um, questions? Basically at the end of our, our time on our webinar, I see noontime here in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, coming at you. Um, are that's my texas pronunciation y'all are free to go back to the rest of your days wherever you are are uh coming in from into the webinar um just uh i want to show really quickly again one more time okay. our special offers we have our five in our air interface class starting october 14th and again, um, chat, if you're interested, uh, Prasad has chatted all the information, of course, and with the codes, the links, okay? So for the 5G in our interface course on October 14th, and then our 5G networks and services course on October 22nd, okay, if you're interested. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for being with me during our, our webinar. I really appreciate good questions and the attention to our our information and i hope to see you again in a, a webinar in the near future